This is the oral history of Joseph S. and Irene Gans. They are the owners and participants and primary owners, in fact, the owners of Gans Multimedia, a multiple system operator headquartered in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. The date is August 3rd, 2001. The place is Gettysburg at the annual meeting of the Pennsylvania Cable and Telecommunications Associations heritage meeting. Uh, Joe uh, is a cable pioneer in both the uppercase P and lowercase. He's both a pioneer, recognized as a pioneer, and actually a very early pioneer of the cable television industry. Uh, Joe, let's start out by giving a brief history of your background prior to getting into cable television. Well, I know before we get into this, I know you did a, an extensive interview with Strat Smith in October of 1989. Right. And I would recommend that anyone viewing this history also review that oral history for a lot of the details that we may not cover today. So please just give us a capsule of your Well, background. what made, made me into this, as a little kid, I enjoyed these uh, so-called crystal radios. In fact, from my mother's house, I had a wire hanging all the way back into the backyard because the longer it was, the easier it was to get radio signals. And me and, uh, believe it or not, Brian uh, Lockman's, I guess it was his uncle, we used to sit there and we had a set of earphones and we'd crystal play, play with the crystal sets. So then when I was inducted into the service in the Army, I guess that was 1944. Right. And... Uh, I was fortunate enough, I got into the, the Army Signal Corps. It was the sig actually the Army uh, Signal Division of the 94th Division. And some of the things that happened there, which I don't know how you relate it to the cable system, but uh, we, uh, we used to send code back and forth, and we never knew what we were sending because everything was coded. And uh, anyhow... But you knew about long-distance transmission and reception. Though. Right. And, but the, another interesting thing, though, is when we actually we were going into Czechoslovakia, and I was there at the end of the war, not the beginning, and the guys in our division found out that we'd put the t uh, antennas up on top of the mountain, and we'd have the trucks there, and no sooner we turned the darn transmitters on, the 88s were shooting and blowing us up. So maybe... <laughs> how this relates to cable, I don't know. What we did then, we put the towers on top of the mountain, but we put the trucks down the bottom of the hill and we run the wire. So you want to shoot it, go ahead, shoot it. We didn't care, you know. <laughs> but you, uh, you did take electronics in high school, and you've also yep. done various right. electronics courses yep. at the various universities, including Penn State, right. is that correct? Well, anyhow, I got home, and my instructor, a man named Tris Lucian, he was the instructor in the government teaching electronics. Can you spell that name, please? L-U-C-I-A-N, Lucian. And anyhow, uh, I went to school with him, and oh, I loved that. I mean, that radio was my thing. And uh, so come, I guess it was November of 1950. Uh, no, even sooner, maybe September of 1950. He told me about a, he knew of a guy named Bob Tartan that was in Lansford, and he was bringing pictures down with amplifiers into town. In the meantime, we were in the cable, or uh, the television business, and I was putting towers up. And it didn't take me long to learn that. We were trying to sell television sets where they didn't get any signal. Where they didn't get no signal. <laughs> and when we'd sell them, if we, uh, in Hazel, if you know it, it's, it's a mountainous area, and the people that live on top of the hills, they got good television, but those behind the hills didn't get nothing. And fortunately enough, the, the first uh, TV store that we built was built up on 9th Street in Hazel on top of the mountain. And we had pretty good pictures up there. And the people would come in and they'd see it. And we sold some of the sets. And, How but, many channels could you get up on there? Uh, we got three, six, and ten. And once in a while, we'd get the New York pictures. Yeah, I wonder, so, that's, that's a separate story. I want to go into that New York situation. Yeah. And then, uh, so when Tris, uh, I, I finished school in uh, 50, I guess it was, 49.50, he told me about Bob Tartland and what they're doing with that. He said he's going to try to put a company together in Hazel, and uh, would I be interested in joining him? And I, I was mediocre because our TV business was good. My wife was running the, the shop and everything else. She keeps and, telling me she was the brains behind it. She was. <laughs> well, 
she, she did all the bookkeeping, the record keeping, everything else. So I was. I that was, was the answering service. <laughs> right. I was climbing the towers. So anyhow, uh, we were selling Philco television sets at the time. In uh, I'd say it was September. Yeah, I went down to Pottsville, and Marty Malarkey happened to be the Philco distributor, and I went in there and. First thing I heard from him, oh, this damn cable company, it's not working good, pictures are no good. I said, what do you mean cable company? He said, well, we have, it was an RCA system. We have a, uh, an antenna up on a mountain someplace and we're bringing these channels in, but the system wasn't reliable. So I figured, holy smokes, if you know Pottsville, that's down in a hole, you know, there's, there's no reception there at all. And so I figured, boy, if he, if he can get pictures down here, there must be something to this cable thing. So I went up, I told Tris, okay, I'll go to work for you. you and my brothers then, and Irene run the TV store, but I started with the cable company. And so you started over at Lansford, is that it? Uh, no, no, in Hazleton. In Hazleton, yeah. There, there was a system Lance, in Lansford was in operation, and they were doing it. I never saw his pictures, but I did see the pictures in in Pottsville, in Lansford, I guess, you know, also was in the bottom of the hill. So who, who owned the system in Hazleton at that time? At that time, then... That's when they were starting to develop it. That's when they were starting system. to develop So uh, he tried to get a local broadcaster, a guy by the name of Vic Deem, and I guess it was the Tito family, mm -hmm. and they were wishy-washy. And then, in the meantime, is the Coriel family. They were in the, in the coal business in Hazleton. And for one night... It was, I forget the fight it was, but anyhow, they came up to our shop, and we had TV sets there, and we, they saw the fight. And uh, they were well, a well-to-do well family, and so Tris talked them in. Where, where was the fight coming from? I New get, York. New, New York, York, I think York. it was New York, yeah. So, Madison Square Garden, something yeah. like that? Something. Non-Channel 11, KPIX? Yeah, I think so. Anyhow, they saw it, and then they told Tris, well, they'll invest the money into this thing, and we'll get the uh, cable system in Hazelden. But you weren't involved as a uh, partner, an equity partner, or an no, equity no, owner at I, that time. I was a chief engineer at the time. Yeah. And we started out with three channels, and this is an interesting one. We get the equipment, we put the towers up on the south in the Hazelden, which wasn't the best place. It was, wasn't as good as the north side. But anyhow, we, we uh, put the amplifiers in, get the pictures, and we're coming down through what we call the heights. And up there, they got some reception out of Philadelphia, but not much. And anyhow, when we turned it on, all of a sudden, we had, well, at that, I later found out what they called radiation. Our lines were leaking. And the people got a black bar down the side of their screen. And, oh, the phones start ringing. What's this cable company coming in? And we just got started. We only had about maybe a mile of wire in there. And so... But I it's more television than they'd ever seen before, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, the word got out now that we can get pictures now into where people can get reception, but we're interfering with the people who did get in reception. Oh, I see. And that's and that's why we put the big black bar yeah. on the screen. So anyhow, uh, I call up the Gerald guys up, and we had, I had two other technicians working with me. And, and you were using Gerald equipment at that time? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so three channel strip amplifiers at each channel, amplifier single location? Single channel amplifiers. And anyhow, the guy comes up, and uh, he's there. He came on a Monday, and I, I forget who it was. It was in the fall. He had his big, long overcoat, and he's writing. I figured, boy, this guy knows what he's doing. He's going to fix this, you know. <laughs> and so come Friday. Do you remember who it was? No, I wish I I'll, If I could, I'd get the name to you. Yeah. But anyhow... He goes up and he says, yep, Joe, you got radiation, gets in his car and goes home. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? He didn't do anything about it, but left to know what he knew. He said your bill, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, we were more or less stymied for a little while there because we couldn't expand too much. And then a guy by the name of uh, Tony Katona came up. And what we start doing then is disconnecting different cables. And here we found out Gerald at that time had the amplifier on one side of the pole and uh, the distribution amplifier on the other side of the pole. And the cable in between the two was the culprit that was leaking. And so as we disconnect that, the, the pictures cleared up, the bar disappeared, and we hooked that up. Between. So believe it or not, what Tony did, he got a piece of 
oh, it looks like half-inch lead wire, telephone wire. And we took and cut it and pulled all of the strips out of there, put the connectors on, and that stopped the radiation, which could have been, I say, the beginning of double shield cable. And what were you doing all this time, Irene? I mean, that time. I'm selling TV sets in our oh, store. Oh, you're still running the, the yeah, television store. I'm still store running the I'm business. Saying. Yeah. I mean, when he left, he still, we went with Mountain City. His brother Eddie and Teddy were still with us, and they did the work, put the towers up, and, and then we were selling TV sets, and they'd install them. And I took care of the shop and my two children and ran the business. Oh, is that all? Did, That's did, all did I did. did. <laughs> Answered the telephone, take all the phone messages. When did you become a, an owner of the Hazelton system? Oh, it was many years later. But it, I actually was never an owner of it. it is, I just was in charge of the construction and so forth like that. And one of the interesting things that we did too, in uh, this same time while we were up on the south end of the town with the antennas, in, uh, up where I lived on 9th Street, I used to pick up the New York channels and I had the Yankee ball games. And uh, whereas on the south side, they were mediocre. So anyhow, I put another big tower out towards the mountain. I put it up and I got channel 11. And the only thing is, the signals were weak. And at that time, we had what is known as the airplane flutter. I don't know if you remember that. I do Picture well. come out and come in and out. So, but anyhow, and, and what I did was the beginning of broadband. I t took the channel six strip and widened it that I can carry five and six because there's a skip in between channels four and five, which if five would interfere with anything, it made no difference. And this, but you were still working for the Hazelton oh, system? Oh, yeah, yeah. Owned yeah. by the Cori uh, Coriolis? Owned by the Coriolis, right. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, we put the Yankee ball games on, and we're down Century Club one night, and the pictures, it's out, it's in and out. People that see a couple innings and this, and that, but uh, Tris told me, he said, Joe, what in the world are you doing? That, that picture's terrible. You can't put that on. I said, well, Tris, that's the best we can get up there. So I said, all right, I'll take it off. So I took it off. That telephone nearly went crazy. And it's a good thing he wasn't sitting by the telephone, but I was. You were. <laughs> you were taking them all, huh? So and anyhow, those coal miners I, let you know, too, oh, didn't oh, they? Oh, yes, they did. <laughs> so then I told Tris, I said, look, let's move the antennas up to where they are today in Hazel. And it's close to where I live, but it was out on the mountain a little bit further. And uh, sure enough, we put it up, and we got channel 11. I stacked the antennas and so forth. And then, and then we found also that we get, get channels 2, 4, 7 out of New York, which were pretty decent. But at that time, we still were carrying Philadelphia t uh, 2 and 4. Mm -hmm. Then we had 5 and 6 with the Yankee ball games on. And the pictures were better. And... This is where Johnny Wasson comes and in. And you were still using no single channel strip amplifiers at oh, yes, amplifier yes. location. Right. So you had a, a oh. box about this big up on the yep. pole. Huh? Yeah. Uh, two big boxes on a pole. <laughs> two big boxes on a pole. <laughs> right. Right. One, did, one was for distribution, the other one was for the amplifiers. And you said that you had, at this time, or prior to this, met uh, John Wasson, at that time, Walsonovich. And, well, here's what happened. Uh, oh, incidentally, another thing to part of history. When we moved from Janesville, we had a little shack there. It was, I'd yeah. call it a shack. It wasn't much of a building. Yeah, a little building. A little building. And anyhow, when we moved up onto the new place, we got an old army bus, I mean a military bus, because they figured it's metal and it won't leak to the antennas and this and that, and we put it up there. So anyhow, Johnny and Pete come up to see me up there in Hazel because they heard we're carrying uh, the yeah. Yankee ball games. And oh, he, they're from Mahoney City. Mahoney City, yeah. yes. And they wanted to know uh, how we're doing this and so forth. So I showed them where the antennas were, how they're working and this and that. And that's, we became real close friends. And he told me where he has an amplifier where he's passing five channels. Luther Holt was building them at that time. You don't hold an amplifier, okay. You know, and which naturally got me interested in, in how he's doing these things. And from there, well, I, we used to see Johnny and Pete, I guess, almost every weekend. And we do Every it. weekend and during the week. But every Sunday, that was a ritual. How far My apart? living room was full of maps all the time. <laughs> no one could even see the rugs. 
what did did you think this was going to be a business at that time, Irene? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, it was it, no know. doubt because. On top of the mountains, we had good pictures. And with amplifiers and preamps and so forth, we can make them bigger uh, or better, you know. And the people down in the valley just couldn't get anything. So, As you built down into the valley uh, in these areas, would you hook up every home as you went along? Or were there some people just holding out, uh, wouldn't buy it for anything? Uh, you were charging $125 or something. Yeah, we, ch we yeah. charge $125 and $375 a month. And the... Uh, uh, I'll tell you, I even got sick one day. I was out to what, 11 or 12 o'clock at night, yeah. putting installs in, and we put in 25 that day, and lung collapsed on me, but you just couldn't keep up with the demand. And, uh, or maybe there were some diehards, but most of the people, as soon as they saw the pictures on the cable, they, they wanted it. And not only that, they had the antennas, the ice and snow and the wind, and it makes that funny sound, a you know, a real bad sound. And you know, there was a lot of repair work to the roofs, and they, they felt the cable was better. So the, and it was. The more cable they built, the more television sets you sold oh, on yeah. the other that's end right. of the whole thing. So that's Actually, mm -hmm. it was a case where we hired contractors from Philadelphia, Hinkles and McCoy, and uh, they, they had all to do to keep us up with what we were building. And then other cable companies were started, so we were doing good. But then, some of the po points about Johnny Wallison, though. We went down to Monte City, and uh, he showed me where he's carrying what was known as the Jason Channel at that time. And normally, you couldn't put Channel 2 and 3 on because the sound of 2 damaged 3, 3 would go against 4. And I got away with the 5 and 6 because of the games. So I said, how in the world are you doing this? You know, I asked him. And what he did, he took the preamp, the Gerald preamp, and he peaked the picture. Instead of, you know, we were taught in school and everything else that uh, the amplifiers should be flat. And the, the broadcaster normally held a sound carrier 6 dB below. But what Johnny did now, he peeked it to the picture and automatically cut the sound. I don't know if he realized that or he was doing, but that's what he did. And he said, look, Joe, see how nice and shiny this picture is? And I said, holy smokes. And quite frankly, mm -hmm. We weren't. You had a great slope. And, and, nice yeah. slope, and the picture was good, and the noise and stuff like that wasn't there anymore. So, and the meters, that, that we didn't have the meters at the time that, that this, this could do it, but th that then later, well, months later, I realized that it's the sound, the sound is uh, down on the slope, and the picture is up high. And it, was, and it worked, it worked good. And so you, then you introduced that broadband amplifier into the system at Hazleton? Yeah, except. I did it a little different. I put tunes system, uh, tune circuits in there. The original he had was all capacitor coupling, and you really couldn't flatten it out and so forth. As whereas I, we we put a, and Johnny didn't like him at first. I, I put tune circuits in there, which can compensate for the cable because the loss on channel six was higher than channel two, and we used to. Uh, be able to carry the pictures you, better. You explained this both in your original oral history with Strat Smith and also in your interview with uh, Archer Taylor, didn't you, for his yep, book? Yep. You explained this also at that time. Because right, right, right. he had a great respect for you and how you would, well. really did that to begin with. <laughs> and when did, you, uh, when did you broaden out then? When did you start business for yourself? Oh, I'd say, oh, let's see, 40... 54. 54, mm -hmm. right, is when we started with... Right. And you, and what time, uh, what year did you get started in, in Hazleton as chief engineer? 50s, there? early 50s. 50, Dece uh, December of 50, yeah. Okay. And so then, I, I worked for the Coriolis, and I have to say something good about them, is I was on their payroll, and we applied for the Weatherly franchise, and I had a few problems getting properties and stuff like that. And believe it or not, Palmer Coriolis said, Joe, you said, uh, you want me, can I help you? Because you can make a They've been good to us in the business, and maybe we can expand. And believe it or not, he got us the property, which I have till today. And um, in the meantime, I'm on his payroll. And then we started, I guess it was and Nuremberg. We, no, we went into Berwick. Oh, Berwick, 19, Berwick. 1955. 55. How large of communities were these? How, uh, how, what was the population of these communities, or how many oh. homes in them? And, and, say, Berwyn. Oh, Berwick is about 30, 35, 40,000 people. Wow, it's a good size. And oh, then, yeah. And Weatherly is like, what, 
three. Five thousand, six thousand. It's a smaller community. Right. And then from then on, uh, what happened is uh, I wanted the Coriolis to spread out faster, and they were satisfied where they were and so forth. So I'd say about 1958 or so, we more or less went on our own, I, even though I did uh, work for them, design work and stuff like that. And you were, you were all in agreement with this, going out on your own, building these systems? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But you, st you were still the one doing the office work and everything like that. And you were still running the television store at this That's time? That's right. <laughs> she typed the franchise contracts, the poll rentals, and everything. We had a, attorneys, you know, but uh, she had to redo and con change the names or upgrade them and stuff. Tell me about you did, when you went in, when you went in to ask for a franchise. Uh, what, what, any problems there? And did you have any? Do, oh, how did you handle it? I was quite fortunate there. I was able to, I guess, give them a good sales pitch because I told them I said, "There's no antennas needed on the roofs. There's uh, the pictures are." far superior in that we take special equipment, antennas and amplifiers to process the signal that you can get the best you can possibly get in the people that were... Uh, but they had never seen television either. At no, a lot of them, no. Oh, yeah. We would invite them to go and see what we did in the other communities. Well, then it's pretty easy to sell at that point. Oh, yeah. And then when we bought Berwick, believe it or not, we got it for what? $30,000. That was a lot of money in those oh, days. Yeah. Yeah. We paid yeah. it off every month. Every and, month. Uh, the, the guy who sold it to us uh, more or less financed it for us, uh, uh, Jimmy Lee. In, in Was he the Lee from Redding? No, no. no that's a different Lee. Huh? It's the Lee yeah. family. But anyhow, uh, and they had the system, but they didn't have, I'd say, the know how. He wasn't it technically. wasn't technically in sound. Time. Yeah. And the sound was off balance and everything else. And he was still staying with the three-channel Gerald system, whereas we came in with already a five-channel system. And, well, and then again, Channel 11 comes into the picture. We, the Yankee ball games is... Uh, That's how you got into the microwave business, wasn't it? That's the beginning <laughs> of it. Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> I was trying to get Channel 11. In fact, I had antennas all over the mountain and everything else, and it just couldn't do it. So I, I belonged to the uh, Institute of Engineers, the Electronic I triple, triple E, and I was at a show in New York, and I saw, or I guess it was Raytheon equipment, where uh, you could do the microwave thing and so forth. And in the meantime, Channel 28, this is about 55, 57. Channel 28 came on the air, and they were getting pictures out of New York, and I'm trying to figure where in the world are they getting them. Here I found out they were up in the Poconos, much closer to New York City, and the pictures are pretty decent there. And uh, <clears throat> they use, actually they had RCA equipment, microwave, and as soon as I saw that, and then I saw the Raytheon equipment in New York, they were, oh boy, this is the way to go. So I talked the Hazelton people into putting in a microwave link, which we did, and uh, that started now clear up. There's one hop then from Poconos in, yeah, into right Hazelton? into Hazelton, yeah. Then Johnny found out about it real quick, and he was a guy, guy, if he heard something new, he wanted to go right now and take a look at it. Let's do it now. Yeah. Do it now. <laughs> so anyhow, and they it comes, did. Comes in one evening. How about with the wedding? Huh? My, sis, my brother's wedding. He's, we're at the reception. John comes and says, Mom, we're going to Massachusetts, wasn't it? Yeah. They got in the choir. The two, three of them went, left us flat at the wedding and they went right to Massachusetts. You heard of a new antenna up there. Yeah. But anyhow, he, he found out we got the microwave in there. And uh, so <clears throat> I this told him. This a single channel microwave of WPIX yeah, from New York. Single channel, right. And they, they had the Yankee franchise at that time. But yeah, right. And so anyhow, uh, we went to the Raytheon people up in, in Massachusetts, and we got uh, permission to use some of their equipment. And this is interesting. Anyhow, we uh, wanted to rent their equipment because uh, Hazelton was, I think, 33 miles, where Bears Head now is about 35 miles or so. And we didn't know for sure it's going to work, so they sent us up to Messina, New York, mm -hmm. where they, and they were building the canals up there. And they had microwave there to show them how the construction was going and stuff like that. So they gave us, loaned us the equipment, and 
they didn't sh we didn't know how to work it, <laughs> what to do, or anything. And then Johnny had a, a habit at that time. He put big telephone poles up to put his antennas on. He had a little platform up there. So we're up in the Poconos. He's down there in, in Bear's Head, in Monte City, and we're trying to give signals as <laughs> whether the picture's coming in. But then I had an amateur radio license, and I got a two-meter uh, ham radio, and we were able to use that for communications back and forth. So after uh, you got uh, Channel 11 in, did you carry it full time or just for the Yankee games? No, we carried full time. Full -time. So yeah. well, the independent then it was it was an independent station, was it? Right, right. And when did you decide that you wanted to bring in other New York channels in? Well, then Channel 5 New York uh, was Dumont at the time. It was one of the better stations there. And now comes the government. And you had to get permission from the stations, the carriers and stuff. Well, like you were a common carrier. Right, right. Microwave. And believe it or not, Johnny and Pete went to New York City until today, summer. They got permission to carry the station. On the microwave system. On the microwave. Yeah. Yeah. That was the distinction that, that Strat tried to make with you the last time right, we talked right, about right. it. Yeah. 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 But and not to carry it, or not per permission to carry it on the system, but to carry it on the microwave system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then he put it on the system and it took the lawyers to get that straightened out, but we got it going. And then where'd you go after that? Well, after Berwick, I guess, where would we go? Well, we built Nuremberg, we went into Benton. Right. And then we went into... Are these uh, still in the same area? Garden yeah. State. Yeah. Then we, we start... Uh, a guy named Sam Edwards used to sell us cable. And uh, he, to uh, he told us about there's areas available in Delaware. Oh, and he was from Reading. Mm -hmm. and he what company was that? As Times was. No, a U.S. Wire. U.S. US wire. wire, okay, because Ray wire. Snyder at the time was with Times, right, wasn't he? Right. Yeah. Was Anyhow, bad. he said that there should be a franchise available in Reading, and Reading was behind the mountains, too. There's there was also a television station in Reading. Yeah, North Channel 61, uh, Humgrave. Uh, That's when things got a little dicey, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, uh, so the, the fact, you know what they did to me, there was a group called Tame. Oh, I remember very well. Yeah. Very well. Yeah, television man antenna manufacturers, something. Enterprises. They yeah. put me on the stage, in, and I realized there were that many TV antenna dealers down there, but boy, they gave us a, a run for our money. And then. Uh, on the radio. And then they put me on the radio, talking back and forth. But uh, we convinced the, the politicians that time that cable television is the way to go here. So then uh, we had a. a a tenant of the franchise for Reading, and we were going to go that. In the meantime, he also told me about systems down in, in Delaware. And the systems in Delaware now were smaller, and I couldn't afford something like Reading, so the Coriels went in, they built Reading, and we started in, 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 uh, in Delaware. And at that time now... We, you, you, had, you had separated yourself from the Coriolis for business purposes. Yeah, well, I still, you still did their antenna them. work and everything else. I sold them equipment, and this is where we now had a five-channel. We were building our own amplifiers. Now. That, uh, I want to go into a little bit more detail of that. Why did you decide to build your own amplifiers? Well, because you couldn't get... Uh, Gerald, at that time, was starting to go in, into multi-channel and stuff like that. But again, it wasn't quite available too soon. And what they did not have at the time was a, an AGC, a system for a, a broadband amplifier. Automatic gain control. Right. So what I did, I put a tone carrier, boy, where the heck was it? it right in between channel four and five. I don't know if it would be 73 or 75 megahertz, but it wasn't, wasn't on the picture. And I took a, a simple AGC circuit, fed some uh, AGC voltage back to the tubes, and it wasn't a, a real perfect system, but it worked anyhow. And that did. was the reason you went into manufacturing yes, your yeah, own, yeah. For the AGC in, yeah. in this broadband amplifier. Right. And I was building them then for Johnny. In fact, we couldn't make them fast enough. And we, were we had about them. five employees building the equipment. How, how many were you turning out at that time? Well, we supplied enough for Peter and John and, yeah. and our own. In our and, own. And plus we were uh, doing... Um, we built Reading. Reading, we built that. Then we started in Delaware. We put the, uh, the... What did you call the amplifier? What was the company, the manufacturer? 
No, we just wouldn't have Cable Equipment and Service Company. That's our yeah. company. Yeah. We, and we, we, Cable we, Equipment and Service Company. And how, over the years, how many of these did you manufacture? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> thousands? Oh, oh yeah. Hundreds? Yeah. Thousands. In fact, George Gardner came up. He wanted to be a distributor for him, and we couldn't make him fast enough. We just, we just didn't want to do that much. You, know, we you, did you said that you probably could have made a business out of the manufacturing had you decided you wanted to go into it. Yeah, right. But uh, but by that time, Gerald was uh, was also... Our Gerald was, was starting to do uh, uh, broadband equipment and so forth. Then a little bit later on, the transistors came in. When did you go to, to the high band? Oh, let's see. When we were still building the equipment. We built some high band equipment. And uh, we put split channel, but high and low. Yeah, right. And we put the equipment down in uh, Reading. Then we started using it ourselves and so forth. And uh, well, in Delaware now we built it, 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 just below Dover, clear down to and Laurel, Delaware. Laurel, Seaford, Milford, Milford, or Rehoboth Beach. We, we did quite a job there. Some interesting things there too. Rehoboth. Oh boy, <laughs> that was, that's, that's a resort area out on right. the coast. Isn't it? We, we put a tower up, and there I was trying to get the Baltimore channels and the Washington channels. And uh, oh, the highway department gave us a problem. Uh, no, it wasn't the highway department. It was the telephone companies. Uh, the power company wouldn't let us on the poles that's to put right. the wire up. This was what, mid-60s? Yeah, right. And uh, so I figured, well, we we'll, bury it or put it underground because Delaware was sandy, was soft and everything else. Also water level. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. So anyhow, we put it in and uh, Tommy Daniels, he was actually a farm boy, he said, well you know there's... But they knew how to run the tractors. We bought a big tractor <laughs> that was a subsoiler. Okay. And uh, so he checked with the highway department. They said, okay, put it in. We had to go down, I think, 18 inches or something like that. And we had to be... 18 inches off the edge of the road. So I checked with the water companies, the telephone companies, and, and he, they said, oh, they're down three feet, they're this and that and everything else. So t Tommy Daniels starts up the tractor, he goes, and oh, he calls me, hurry up, Joe, come running up. I said, what's wrong? I get up there, the water shooting up in the air. <laughs> they ripped up the telephone lines, the water lines, but would you believe that we had the paperwork done on everything there, we had the permission, and uh, neither the telephone companies nor the water companies didn't cost us a cent. They, because they didn't know where their lines were. No, right? they didn't know, and, and they weren't where they were supposed to be, see? So so you built Rehoboth all underground, even though with the water yeah. level right yeah. about... Yeah. That, uh, Rehoboth, and actually, we had to run from the antenna site, I guess about 15 miles into the town. Oh, yeah, antenna site was out, outside of Mil Milford. And mm -hmm. we, Run it down there. And at that time, there was no uh, AML microwave or anything available to you? No, not, not at that time. Then another interesting thing with these so-called 18 inches, every time the highway department put up a sign, theirs was also 18 inches off. off. <laughs> Whenever we get a failure, we just go look for a new road sign, and sure <laughs> enough, there was a cable cut in half. Yeah. And so that, now you'd expand it out onto the coast. Where'd you go after that? Well... We built Delaware, then I guess we went to New Jersey. We knew, yeah, Garden State. Garden State, which is uh, Sparta, Franklin, that whole complex there. Now, now you were in the area, though, where there were off-the-air signals, were you? Well, except that when I always drove through a town, I looked to see on top of the roofs how big the antennas were. And you can tell pretty quick whether there are good pictures there. And Sparta had some pictures, but Hamburg and Franklin were behind the mountain. So we got the franchise. So you were still behind the mountains in most of those areas, though. Yeah, right. Where was the first system you built? Where, well, you, I, I know you went out to Tucson. I want to get into a little bit yeah, of that. Okay. Where was the first system you built where you were actually built in a market that had good television? Future Vision. New, New Jersey. That's Eatontown, uh, Oceanport, Oceanside, that whole area. We put it in there. Seabright. Seabright. In fact, Seabright, if you know where it is, that's the upper end of New Jersey. It's pretty close out of, out of uh, New York City. And quite frankly, now, that system grew slow. It wasn't really fast. You really had to do some marketing in that system. Yeah, right. That yeah. was the first time you really had a market, though. Right. Okay. And um, unfortunately, we had, would you believe, uh, a passing of, what was it, 150,000, 200,000 homes. We Fine. passed there. But... Uh, uh, 
the uh, demand for cable was slow, wasn't doing too good, and the people that were, that was a partnership, that was other people involved, they got nervous and we sold that company. But what we did have there at that time, we had some of the pictures out of Philadelphia, plus New York and everything else. That and came to a screeching halt though yeah. pretty quick though. Yeah. We sold that to store. Yeah. To store? Broadcasting, yeah. And another thing we did there now is uh, uh, the, we had 12 channels at the time and the people, like I mentioned, were getting pretty good pictures off the air. So what I did is put a dual system in there. I had dual cables, 12 channels on the one and 12 channels on the other. And it was, it was an expensive system. It was. But, uh, oh, today it's a big company, but uh, at that time, and satellites weren't, uh, broadcasting wasn't quite available. And what we did is the Mammoth Racetrack, we carried the races there. Oh, it's, I, I and then we had a, that. Yeah, we had some local origination programs. So we had some subscribers, but not really good. Tell me what you did on local origination up there. Oh, we had, uh, uh, local politicians coming in, and, uh, and I guess that the horse races were on. We did you actually send your crews out to film the races themselves? Yeah. Oh, did you I, have to I, delay them or anything? No, no. We, uh, in fact, if I remember now, that the, the racetrack had their own cameras, and we just tapped in there, run the line back, and we were carrying the the racetrack. For it. And you never got involved with the gamblers or with no, the mafia, no, or anybody no. else who wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the investors in the cable system was part owner in the track. Okay. Right. Yeah. Harvey Wardell, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they never tried to uh, delay them so that they would get the call early on and uh, things like that? Maybe they did. I don't remember. But well, uh, That wasn't anything you were cared about. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you were still handling all of the office for work for all of these systems at this time? Oh, yeah. yeah. Not, not through tradition. <coughs> I didn't do their work. We, we went in and taught them what to do and how to set up the offices and their records. Well, she'd go down and uh, we'd hire people and set up the books. And then my, later on, my daughter, Janice, she went down to the, uh, Reading, or the Delaware. No, not yeah. Delaware, New Jersey. Yeah. Oh, that's right, New Jersey. She, she went down there and helped set the books up. And then as we were expanding, then Janice, as well as Irene, got involved in the setting the office Look, up. Let's go, you, you actually, you got into business for yourselves in about <clears throat> the 60s. Let's go, how many subscribers did you have in the 60s, at the, at the end of the 60s? Roughly, Irene, I don't, I don't need to know it to the exact <laughs> number, what? Mm. Um, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000? No, no, maybe 20, 25,000. The so. end of the 70s? Yeah. How many at the end of the 70s? 70s, oh, they were getting if you added them all together, over 50. Yeah, well, well over the 50, end of the 000. 80s. 80s? Oh, we're approaching 70,000, because 80s, we still had the Northeast system, which is mm -hmm. pretty big, and our other companies are growing pretty good. And at the end of the 90s? Oh, boy. Well, we just kept growing. Today? I how, don't know. How many <laughs> do you have today? Over, over 50,000, 60,000. We sold some of the company. Okay. Yeah. So what the fifty or sixty thousand was not necessarily the most you ever had. No, no, no more. Saying about eighty thousand was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to remember, in when was Carter president? In the eighties. Yeah, somewhere in there. Interest yeah, rates. I know twenty four percent. Twenty four percent, and we do believe we were six over prime, so you, you just couldn't do it. Yeah. So that's, when, that's when uh, John Malone helped you, did you not? John Malone came in and he, he told me, God bless the man, he's really good. Uh, he's, he, I was going to sell the company. He said, Joe, what do you want to sell it for? He said, I said, let's sell me part of it. I think it was 45% okay. mm -hmm. and we'll mm -hmm. give you the money, and he, which he did. He bailed me out. And then if you want to keep expanding, whatever you want to do is up to me. And so we had a good buy-sell agreement. And... Uh, Come, I guess it was 1990? Yes, 991. 91, uh, we bought him out, and I paid him back much more than what he gave me, but I had that many more subscribers. Now, he did that with Lenfest, he did it with Breslin. No, no, this is strictly with TCI. Oh, that's what I mean, TCI did it with uh, Oh, yeah, John right, Malone. right. He did, did the it with same. Lenfest, yeah. and he did it with Breslin, and a yeah. number of others, too, yeah. that, that he did it. In fact, uh, Jerry Lenfest, 
told me about, you know, that, the kind of things he was doing, the agreements he had with, with TCI. And, but I never went the pub, public route, you know, like Regas did. We, and John even asked, Regas now asked me to go with him, but we stay, we always, till today, we still own our We're company. independent, we just We're independent. don't have to worry about stockholders right, or right. anybody else like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where do you want to go now? What do you want to do, anything about, you want to build another place? You want to buy another well, place? Well, my sons have more or less running the company now, and we're total fiber optics. All the systems, they're interconnected with fiber, and. Oh, we have some systems in Maryland now, I guess. In St. Mary's. St. Mary's down there and down. In it's on the bay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah right. We have some down in Kentucky. He's looking at Where in Kentucky? I don't really know. He, he's, he's taking care of all that. Yeah. Tell me about Tucson. How did you get involved in that? That seems to be way out of the area that yeah. you... That you there was a, a guy, a friend of mine, was on the NCTA Independent Operators Board. And he Lee Druckmann? Was it? Uh, Brian Blow. Okay, Brian Blow. I know Brian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he more or less told me that there are systems available in, in, in Arizona and they need some work and so forth. So not in Tucson itself, though, was there? No, not, not, in, not the big the Tucson estates. It's, it's the housing development outside of Tucson. Okay. Then we, there were some Indian villages there. Which, there's a different kind of construction there, but we hired, believe it or not, Indians and sure. they run the system and we bought them, and they're doing pretty good. Yeah. Johnny Monroe was no Jim Monroe was down right, there too right. in that area. So, right. um, Solo or and some of those others, Fort yeah. Huachuca in that area down in there. Right, right, yeah. yeah. In fact, they're expanding the one system. Uh, I guess it's Tucson, and but there, you know, these these developers come in, they'll put up 200 units in, you know, in real quick, and so. It's, just but you've got to get all the wire in there first. Yeah. It's a big capital outlay when you go in mm -hmm. there for those new developments down there. I know that. What were you doing all this time, other than taking care of the family, the office, the books, and other things like that? I was and, busy and keeping all the him time. straight. And, uh, well, if he was out, someone had to be home, right? right. Two people couldn't go. <laughs> oh, I took care of all the records. There was an awful lot of work. We had, what, 14, 15 franchises and paying, you know, take care of all of that and build customers and keep Well, we built Northeast. We had 33 franchises up there. Mm -hmm. Then we built the upper end in New York. 33 franchises? Right. And, what is that? On, where, where was that? In? Around, all around Scranton. Scranton. Clear up into Clark Summit. Uh, and then we built the Poconos. In, uh, Resort areas in the Poconos? Yeah, right. And then we built upper end. Oh, we did the Poconos in the 60s. Yeah. And that, we, that's our own. And we built the upper end of New York State from be between Syracuse and Watertown, all the, all the little towns in between here. Well, you, you've been honored by the Pennsylvania Association in various ways over the years. So that, that really meant something to you, didn't it, to be oh, accepted yeah. and honored by them? Oh, yeah. You're also a founder, weren't you, by the uh, uh, yeah. Pennsylvania Cable Television Association? This business has been in my blood. I, I knew it's it going to be a success. Just like today, you just saying, what are we going to do now? My son is going hot, real heavy into this high-speed access, the data transmission, and our systems now, I don't know, what you have four or 500 channels with the data transmission, and there's so many things to be done, and we're almost finished with the return lines, which now means out of your home, anything you want to access, any satellite and so forth, you're going to be able to do it. And you're doing that in all of your systems? Yep. Yep. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, to keep up to speed with the satellite transmission, you almost have to do it. And besides, there's a good market out there, a little good market. I think that's right. I think that's right. You were also on the board of directors of the PCN, is that right? The um, Pennsylvania oh, Cable yeah, Network. Yeah, yeah. When did you get involved with that? Oh, this is a good one, too. In the beginning. Okay, well, I was one of the founders of it. We started, uh, well, I believe the man's name was Pittinger. He was a uh, administrator for Pennsylvania schools or something, and uh, he wanted to interconnect the schools with television. And so, uh, being that we built some of the microwave systems in Pennsylvania, uh, when uh, we worked with the what do you call it, the, picking out the, fre uh, the frequencies and the uh, lay of the land, 
I noticed that, well, I saw right away that the antenna sites, cable antenna sites in Pennsylvania, you might as well say, all look at each other. And so we went up to, I went up to the Poconos to the fire tower there, and I talked to Dixon Miller, and he said, well, there's a, a Pennsylvania uh, fire watch systems where the, the towers, or the fire towers, all can see each other. And with, when there's a fire, they coordinate where the problems are and so forth. And I figured, boy, there's a natural now to put microwave because here's the properties away, available. Uh, most of them, not most of them, but a lot of them have power coming up. And all we got to do is put the towers up and we've got a microwave in the connect. So anyhow, Marlo Fruck, this is when he came into this. And I, because Penn State at the time had uh, the PSX, it was an educational channel. And uh, this may be the opening for interconnecting all the towns with uh, Excuse me, Joe, as an aside, Marlo Froke is the chairman emeritus of the Cable Television Center and past president of, of the center. It? Right, right, yeah. okay. So please go ahead. And yeah. answer. Anyhow, Marlo and I drove out to uh, uh, see the Barcos now. And George Barco was still our legal counsel and all. And, and I told George, I said, you know, this, the state now was going to invest $30 million to build uh, this educational uh, television network. And I said, boy, you know, with uh, the fire towers available, plus the cable systems towers available, I said, I bet we can do that for a heck of a lot less money. And so George said, okay. And then when Marlo and I were driving back to uh, State College and Somehow we got talking about videotapes and programs. He, and Marlo told me, he said, Joe, did you ever see the tapes that we have here at the university? I said, no. And this, at this time, uh, we were trying to get more and different television in, in the Northeast system up in Scranton area. And he, so he showed me, I said, well, you think you can wait, work out something where we can get these tapes and play them back on our cable companies? He said, oh, sure, I'll see what I can do. So he got somehow with the, the dean of the school to give us the tapes and we put it a, a small call it a playback unit in uh, Worthington, Worthington campus. campus up in, uh, in Dunmore and I hired a, a, one of the school kids there and they'd run the tapes and they put it on, on our cable company in Northeast. Did the schools have sets to be able to, uh, to view they these? Had or some, they had some, not many, but they things? had some. But uh, my market was more for the homes. Here, here's a new channel out of Penn State and so forth. And so uh, we got to start running the tapes on the Dunmore system and immediately, you know, the neighboring systems find out. Remember George, what year this was? <laughs> George Barco finds out and real quick, let's, let's do this. And so we, a couple of us got together, we put some money in it, and we started from Penn State. And we came up into, uh, into Dunmore. Then when we got that connected, you know, Berwick was already on, on the system. Did you ever get any state funds? No. Uh -uh, no. All private funds. All, all private mm -hmm. funds, yeah. And that, that is what's developed into the PCN today, is it? PCN network, right. How long did you really uh, do educational work on the PCN? Well, we're still doing some. To what extent? Oh, uh, well, I don't know about Penn State now, but uh, Brian uh, has uh, different programs on her in and quite frankly, the kind of programs he's running with the, with the political answers and everything else, that, that, to me, that's educational. Okay. And, I would agree with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. The, okay. the Penn State uh, C-SPAN, huh? Yeah. And then where we run into a problem a little bit with Penn State, we put together, I think it was anywhere from 3 to $5 million dollars, and then we wanted them to build a school of communications in, in Penn State. And somehow, I forget the guy, it was an English guy. Anyhow, he wanted Winston. to build a, huh? Winston. Yeah, I forget. Anyhow, he wanted to build a school of journalism. And I, I was more interested in finding a place where I can send my employees to bring them up to date. And that's when uh, we would talk with Marlowe in the thing with the uh, moving this uh, cable museum, cable museum and whatever in, into Denver, because now I could see where 
putting it in Denver, there, there was the university there, you got cable labs there, you got all kinds of educational things, and we're, I know like Regus. And you got Dan Ritchie. Right, Dan Ritchie, and, but it's gonna be a place I can send technicians and office employees and so forth, and keep them up to speed, because the trade, the technology is going so fast that you've got to have a place where you can train somebody. That's true. And there, would you believe there is no place, really, where you can that's, send that's them? That's still hard to believe. And some of the technical yeah. schools, I guess, you can get some information. Yeah, get some, that. but uh, not really where I can send the guy in there when he comes home back that he got a degree or he got a certificate, whatever. And he, Isn't the University of Illinois in Champaign, don't they do some of this work? Doctor, they do uh, some, but Lally? this would be a cable center. Yes. Yeah, I realize that. I'm not just, but I thought there was some, something. Exact. Yeah, that, the Illinois does have something. You, you triggered another thought in my mind. You mentioned that uh, George Barco was your attorney. Right. And he was for many cable systems in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> do you remember his battle over the excise tax in the 50s? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell, yeah. Tell me about that, will yeah. you please? Sure, and they're talking about the safe tax. Yes, well, it was a federal tax, is what it was charging 8% mm -hmm. on everything yeah. he was collected, and George took it to the Supreme Court. So you, yeah. Do you remember and this? He beat it, yeah. yeah. Well, they all did that. They did all the legal work. George, I'm sorry? George and Yolanda, they did all the legal work yeah. on that. And they represented the yeah, entire Pennsylvania industry. Association. State association. Yeah. They Somebody's represented all the members of the association. And he, <clears throat> he took it all the way to the Supreme Court, is that correct? Right, right. Did, you lost on the local level, you lost in the state court, or right, in right. the appeals court, and he took it to the Supreme Court where you won. Right. What year was that, do you remember? Oh, uh, middle 60s. Yeah, because uh, Pete uh, was in trouble there with that. That would be about, yeah, about 64, 65. Was it that late? I thought it was. Uh, oh, it was right before 64. He died in 64. It had to be uh -huh. earlier. Okay. Late I thought it was in the 50s, but I, I couldn't Maybe even. 59 or in around there. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, uh, the other thing George did, too, is uh, uh, we got hit with copyrights in uh, uh, <laughs> February 1966. I'll never forget that. And, and what happened there is we couldn't, the government put on that we can't carry nothing but local channels. That very well. And uh, so they went in and to make a, a deal with the copyright owners, the broad broadcasters and all. And then I was on the NCGA board at that time. And I guess it was 1972. Yeah, in fact, we were there a couple of times and I stood in line with Jack Valenti and George Bacco and, you know, and we're going up before the courts as to what to do with the copyrights and so forth. But uh, we made an agreement with the broadcasters in 72. Were you in agreement with that, uh, that compromise that was made? I was, and believe it or not, George wasn't. I, I, re, I, I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> he was very adamant about that. He, was. He, was, he didn't want to do it, but, uh, and, uh, and they blamed Johnny Watson was the, uh, the vote that swung it the other way, but uh, I was one. I know, that, I know on, on the NCTA board, it could have yeah. gone one way or the other, yeah. but they had to finally agree with it. Yeah. You, when, when years were you on the NCTA board? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, the I, 70s. In this, like, the 70s right up to... Up to the 90s, 90s yeah. Because mm -hmm. you go on for two years, then you had, they had to go off and on. So I was on at least five, six times. Do you remember who, who the chairman of the, of the NCTAs? Uh, oh, it was what? Bob Smith was on, uh, Jim Mooney. There's a whole, whole mess of them. No, they were the presidents. Remember the, the uh, volunteer the chairman were, though, was Jerry Lind uh, Lindquist. Uh, was, yeah. Uh, he was one of them. I'm trying to remember. Was Jack Crosby the chairman one time in the yeah, yeah. So you, you, Bill you President were, was go chairman. Over. Dan Aaron, oh, oh, Mason, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have any uh, any dealings with Dan? Dan Aaron. Dan Aaron. Oh yeah, sure. Well, uh, in fact, going back into the fifties and sixties, when we used to have the conventions, that they used to be what we call the Gerald Suite, and after the thing. Why we go up there and have a couple beers, but the thing that we did there, each of the the guys that talked to each other as to how to fix this, how you fix that, how you fix that, and one I'll never forget was with Vic Nicholson, where there and this was early '60s, and we still had the, the antenna side the equipment was crude, the preamps and the amplifiers and all, and uh, I told, uh, well, Vic and I just had a discussion. The way a TV set works, 
you can hook it in and pick up anything off an antenna. And what they did is put a system where they have the tuner and amplifier and the AGC. And believe it or not, whatever, I, I have written somewhere what year it was. But next year we come out, go to the convention, and they have what they call the channel commander. Channel commander, right. Which, oh, what a blessing that was. It was. It was really good. And it was as a result of have guys. All the men sitting there talking. That's all they talk. Shop. <laughs> talk. Amplifiers. What do you do with this? I have a problem this way. How can I fix this? You know, I used to sit and listen to them all the time. Now this, but you, you, you concentrated on Gerald, though, but you also had Secor here in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Didn't you? Oh, yeah. Jimmy Palmer. Oh, Secor now, the, the Doc Brown, Dr. Brown. So that was in the 50s yet. Is the, we were still trying to get a, 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 a multi-channel amplifier built. And he come up with what they call a chain amplifier. And he and I used to go out at night and try to equalize the cable so that it would match the the chain amplifier. You did it all over again the next morning, I don't know. <laughs> then when the sun came out, the, 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 cable, the cable went flopped over the other way. And, and another thing with the story, at that time, Johnny had his whole amplifiers and he had some of ours, and same thing. It's one uh, it's a set of cable attenuation in the daytime, another one at night. So what Pete would do every night, uh, in the evening, when the sun would go down, he took his Cadillac, he drive down, and he balanced the amplifier. Oh, now, so another, they, they kept theirs down. They didn't put them way up on the pole. I was going to say, another thing Johnny did is we had our amplifiers up on top of the poles. And one bad thing with that was we'd be balancing during the night, and you're on a ladder, and we didn't have too good a communication, so we're yelling up and to, down and to, this and that. The windows that go up, shut the heck up, you know, <laughs> we're trying to get some sleep. I'm surprised that the, uh, the telephone companies allowed those uh, yeah. amplifiers that low because they always say they interfere with the climbing of the poles. To get right. And it did. Oh, yeah. But he, he put his amplifiers down and made good sense because the, the, later on, though, from the power company, he got permission. They gave us specs as to how to put them in until we went solid state why the amplifiers were down. Yeah. And another thing he did too, oh, I'll tell you, you could write a book almost about him, is in the beginning when he came, first he came in with the twin lead. I didn't know him at that time. And then when I talked to him. Called open wire? Oh, yeah, open wire and heavy twin lead. And uh, so when I talked him into moving his antenna site to a mountain, which he did, and we couldn't get no power up the mountain. So somewhere along the way, he found what they call the K14 cable, if you remember that. It was a big fat cable. Mm -hmm and about a number 12 wire in the center of it. And we run that up the mountain. He, well, he run it up the mountain. And we sent the power up the cable and the television down the cable. I think and, that was the first time that was ever done, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then later on, and that's when he started cascading, too. He came down from Bar Bear's Head, down through Marnay City, and then he's going down towards Girardville and everything else. And the only problem there was... Uh, Again, the cascade was pretty long, and it was pretty hard to control that signal. But then a new thing happened to us, too. <clears throat> After about a year or two, the attenuation got pretty heavy in the cable, and we couldn't figure out what in the world was happening. And here we found... Attenuation was lost, the signal loss. Yeah, yeah, right, right, the, the loss of signal. It's uh, it was a characteristic of the cable change. So... Somewhere along the line, on one of the amps that were down, we saw some water coming out of connectors. And sure enough, what happened was everywhere the cable sagged. We went there and cut the thing, and water came out. Put a spigot in the <laughs> That's just some of the things we had to learn the hard way, you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to build any more systems right now? You know, you say your boys are doing it now. Uh, they're doing it. Well, right now, it's, as far as new franchise territory, there aren't many available. But there's systems available that uh, need upgrading, need fibers, need improvements, stuff like that. And the owners, quite frankly, aren't going to spend the money to upgrade them. So we're trying to purchase them and, and upgrade. And that's what they're doing. Yeah. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's a difficult. Well, the smaller systems right now are not that much in demand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. are not that much in demand. No. Right no, no. So you yeah. can't put together. Now, you've clustered some of your systems also, oh, yeah, haven't a lot you? Of them. In fact, you 
somebody said that you were one of the early people to uh, start clustering. Yeah. You right. did around Hazleton. Yeah, right. <coughs> Hazleton, Berwick, the Poconos, it's all clustered. And <clears throat> in the northeast was one big cluster of systems up there. And that was out in New Jersey and uh, New Jersey Delaware. Was well, and Delaware, and they're all clustered, yeah. yeah. That made good sense. You'd have one antenna site, uh, at the most two, and you can feed all, all the towns around it. Now, you mentioned a couple of people that have had a major impact on your business over the years. Uh, John Walson is one of them. Uh, yeah. John Malone is another. Right. Can you think of any others that have had a major impact on you and or your business? Well, again, that guy had, had a lot of, as I mentioned, Vic Nicholson came with the channel. Gerald. He was Gerald. Channel commander. Uh, <clears throat> and then you know, the C Corps people <clears throat> came out with, uh, again, the first broadband systems, actually 220 megahertz and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. The other guy would be Jim Peterson. <laughs> oh, yeah, from the bank. <laughs> oh, from the bank. bank, yeah. In New York? Yeah. Well, we were looking for funding. In Chicago. In Chicago? Yeah. And uh, so I talked to him, and John uh, Regas, too. Every, every time he and I drove in between the systems, why we, all we did is talk about the banks and stuff like that. So uh, uh, I met uh, Jim Pearson, I don't remember where. That's when we were in the Northeast. Yeah, I wanted to. Oh, you met him at, we, we knew him from be, being at the convention. At the convention, anyhow. National one. And I told him what I'm trying to do, and uh, so I met with, uh, oh, what was it, Mellon Bank. Mm -hmm. in, in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, and they, uh, the, the kind of agreement they want, they had to give them everything but her clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, geez. It's, it's a system that I'm going to buy it, um, you know, and, and back it up with. So uh, I walked out on that. And would you believe I went to Chicago and had my projections and so forth. And I start walking around to the different banks to see who would listen or talk to me. And I went to see Jim Pearson. And he said, boy, he said, I'm mad at you. I said, why? He said, I thought you were going to come in here first. And he was ready for us. And mm -hmm. believe it or not, well, I guess it was in about uh, two, three days, we had the loan. And even when he told this to my attorney, he said, no way in heck can you gonna get something. It's going to take you two weeks. I know all the paperwork that's going to be involved. And Jim said, no, it won't. He said, two, three days, we'll be done. And they and were. This, this was Continental Bank in, yeah. in mm -hmm. Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. What year was this? 77, 80. Se 77. 77, yeah. And we bought early, the Northeast. When, that's when the banks were starting to, to get uh, interested in, mm -hmm. in the yeah, business. Yeah, right, so. right. You didn't give any personal guarantees at any time? No. It's, uh, it's quite a tribute. Yeah. No, this your system was the guarantee. Well, I now that, they believed in it. You know, in the beginning they didn't believe in cable, but then after that they there was a worth to it. People tell you in the early days that you were foolish to get into this business that never lasts. The television oh, stations yeah. come Lots on the air, and especially in the fifties. Yeah. And there again, it was almost impossible to get financing. Lucky enough, some of our local people, Mike Romantic, yeah. people we knew. People we knew. Local that, banks, did you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but then we had put the collateral for that. We had to collateralize yeah. the loan. So you, uh, you did use some of your personal assets then, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Your home and other things beginning. like that in the beginning. Yeah. Very beginning. Yeah. 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 So now you're just kind of taking it easy and uh, you know, playing golf or whatever you want to do. It's, uh, yeah, I'm a fisherman and a boatman. You're still not spending any time at home, though, huh? Well, yes, we are. Some. We come I mean, home, get the work done, then we go off again. Okay, but you're going fishing with him now. Oh, yes. Okay. But I still like what's happening with the cable center and thing and the potential they have. Yes, he's still on the board of uh, Cable Labs and he's still on cable he's still, labs. still involved. Huh? Yeah. Well, we, they're, they're, they're a great help to us, and it's going to be interesting when they put all of that equipment into the uh, cable center. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. When are you going to come out and see us? Oh, yeah. Well, we, I got some put out there, too. But, I think there's some uh, Luther Holtz amplifiers, some of ours there around. Yeah, well, I know Dave Willis has those on uh, in in the uh, archives right now, and they'll go out there. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize he had some of the Holtz though. And yeah. I where was Luther's uh, plant? Was that in, in Monty Mon City? Monty City? Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know where we're going to go with this any farther, so I think we'll just put a stop to it there. And uh, I think we've covered a lot of the things that you may not have covered in your original oral history. And again. I would repeat that anyone looking at this interview should also 
review the transcript of your oral history done at Pennsylvania uh, University, Penn, uh, Penn State University, uh, in October of 1989 by Professor uh, Strat Smith. This has been the oral history of Joseph S. S. and Irene Gans. The date again is August the 3rd, 2001. We're in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Your interviewer was Jim Keller. Thanks, Joe, and thank you, Irene. It's been a very pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you.